I officially open the meeting. Uh, welcome to the Department of Public Enterprises, the minister and the entire team, deputy minister, and the, the official from the Department of Public Enterprises and yourself, honorable members, you are all welcome. This is your meeting of the 16th March, 2002. Uh, without wasting time, let me quickly go to Mr. Tisang Mutsumi, just to take us through if there are any apologies. Uh, good morning, Chair and members and colleagues. The apologies we've received is from Mr. Kwankwa, who won't be able to join us today. We've also received an apology from the minister who is in a cabinet committee meeting. The department is led by the deputy minister and the director general, Jefferson, and um, the officials. Thank you. Chair? Yes. Somebody speaking. Who is that? Uh, is I'm so uh, Thank you so much. Good morning. I forward up. It's honorable command. Honorable command, your money. Yes. yes. I'm, I'm, I'm forwarding that. Honorable command. You've got a very, very bad uh, network problem there. Can you sort yourself? Yes, I've got a problem. Yes, sir. Yeah, but uh, I captured what you said. That is... Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, that is the apologies, honorable members. Honorable members, today we'll be getting a presentation on police impediment that will be presented by the Department of uh, I mean the Department of Public Enterprises. Uh, as it indicated that the minister is not going to be there here, but the deputy minister, as always, is here. Uh, will be doing the overview and the give to his team led by the DG. Uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. And uh, greetings to all the Honorable Members and the uh, participants in the meeting, uh, the DG and the team. Thank you, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, I will just make a, a, a few remarks after which uh, we, we can uh, let uh, the, the director general as, as then uh, introduced the team as well as uh, go on with the presentation. May I say, Chair, that uh, uh, public state-owned companies uh, generally find themselves having to observe uh, both um, the Companies Act, uh, which uh, governs uh, all uh, private companies, they also have to observe uh, the rigor of uh, the Public Service Act that's applicable to uh, the rest of the uh, government departments. This somewhat presents a, a very uh, uh, interesting challenge, uh, which uh, we are struggling with finding a way around so as to really smoothen processes so that the agility that uh, these uh, state-owned companies that they should have is not lost. Uh, it is a common cause that uh, owing to a number of approvals that uh, for any major decisions that they need to make, there is often a very long process that must take account of uh, the requirements of the public, uh, of, the, of, of, of um, the, the, the procurement in the public sector which tends to impact in the time in which they can deliver uh, uh, on the uh, undertakings that they have. 
uh, we, we have been engaging with the treasury with the view to finding ways in which was not going away from the need for accountability, uh, transformation in terms of uh, the goals we have, but it is done in a manner that uh, doesn't uh, deprive the state-owned companies the flexibility and speed with which they must uh, uh, respond uh, to challenges. So uh, we will, uh, in the presentation, uh, speak to those uh, elements uh, as well as regulations uh, for which treasuries also be engaged on them. Uh, that's really the context. Uh, the DG may then uh, take the matter forward and uh, invite the team that will present if he is not presenting himself. With your permission, Chair, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, the DG. Uh, good morning, Chair, and um, I hope I'm, I'm visible. And, and good morning to the members. And DM, good morning. Um, uh, Chair, I'm accompanied today by uh, uh, my colleague, Ms. Boyotlale, who will be uh, doing the presentation. Um, and she has, um, she'll introduce uh, the colleagues uh, from the SOCs that she has asked uh, to join her uh, in this presentation and, and obviously to assist with the questions later on. Um, on that note, Chair, with your permission, I'll ask um, Ms. Tale to, to come on. Thank you so much. Voyon, please come in. If I may, uh, this is the chair of the SPC. Um, good morning, honorable members of my SPC colleagues, uh, SPC colleagues. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have been asked by- Will you just raise your voice a bit? Um, okay. I'm gonna try a different audio mechanism. Um, I will apologize for that. Is this better? Yeah, continue, please. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so we've been asked by the Portfolio Committee to do a presentation on the challenges that have been faced by the DCE SOCs as it, release, as it relates to procurement. Um, we've run a presentation Voyo, um, my apologies, Chair. Voyo, are you using, are you using um, a separate microphone? I think that's where your problems could be emanating from. Do you want to maybe disconnect that and speak directly into the laptop's microphone? I have disconnected. Is this better? Yeah, much better, thank you, much better. Okay. Thank you, uh, and I will apologize again for that. Okay, uh, is my presentation visible? Yes, Vuyo, yes, Vuyo, it is. Thank you very much. Um, so let me continue. Thank you, through you, Chairperson. I will now start on the presentation. Um, just to give an overall context, um, in one of the main challenges um, in public procurement is to strike an appropriate balance between uh, operational efficiency and compliance. Uh, whilst compliance minimizes the risk of corruption and ensures impartial equal treatment of bidders, um, efficiency seeks to ensure agility, uh, speed of decision making and attainment of the most economically advantageous outcome in respect of price, quality, um, et cetera. Our major SOCs operate in a highly competitive and a very challenging environment. So what we're looking for is more agile and responsiveness in decision-making processes. Um, public sector procurement um, operating in an environment of increasingly intense scrutiny driven by continuous technology changes, program reviews, 
and public and political expectations for service. There are different experiences in the field of procurement within the private and the public and the public sector. Um, that's that's part of the work that we've been doing um, and what we've we've realized. Um, SOCs, not just the DPE SOCs, they've been highlighting uh, procurement issues, uh, which in some instances undermine and compromise their ability to deliver on, on their strategic objectives. Um, in terms of the procurement rules, the time taken from issue of a tender to the implementation of that tender does not take into consideration um, the existing systems the size of the organization and operational contingencies that need urgent attention. SOCs have increasingly received qualified audit opinions in relation to procurement and contract management as a result. The department through the DG has been engaging with the SOCs under its portfolio, as well as with the national treasury to try and find an appropriate solution. Um, a list of uh, legislative challenges and proposed solutions was developed and submitted to the National Treasury for further con uh, consideration. This presentation will detail those challenges and proposals as submitted to the National Treasury. However, it must be stated that our state-owned companies still need to ensure that all legislative prescripts must be adhered to. So, um, the the presentation is broken down into two, into two. We deal with the generic challenges um, that public sector um, uh, companies, entities, or organs of state experience in terms of procurement. And then we deal with the legislative prescripts that are posing a problem to our, um, all our SOCs. So I'm going to start with dealing with the generic challenges. Uh, one of the issues that's really come up is the issue of red tape. Um, when you look at what uh, public sector entities and organs of state have to deal with, these are the private sector. Um, for public sector um, entities, there are many documents um, and referrals guiding the procurement process, for example, the PFMA, the triple PFA, triple PE, et cetera. Public organizations belong to multiple jurisdictions and their procurement practices must strictly be approved in line with, with treasury directives. Um, challenges have been experienced with the directives. Um, I'm listing the following um, as an example. Uh, the directives are um, issued by the Treasury are uh, issued uh, with no proper or limited com consultation with affected entities and the organs of state. And the practicality of the directives versus the reality um, is a different matter. It is basically a top down instruction coming from whichever policy department that is issuing the directive or instructions. Uh, and the instructions sometimes are not suitable um, to the operations of the SOC. Um, the other area that's been a challenge is the automation and reporting lines. Um, full automation and, streamline and streamlining can help optimize the process, even with many steps that would be involved along the way. Um, and the challenges the SOCs um, have found is that there's different uh, automated systems across government, and then they have their own um, systems that they are utilizing. And sometimes there isn't an alignment and there isn't a streamlining that can be put into place. So uh, we, we, we need to look at how we assist the SOCs in terms of the automation process. Um, the procurement functions in the SOCs reports to the CFOs and the functions are clearly articulated in legislation and regulation. Um, this limits the, agilities or the agility of the uh, supply chain management function within the SOCs as it has to strictly adhere to these uh, and failure to adhere to these uh, will lead to audit findings. So we need to find a, a medium that will allow agility for the SOCs in that particular SEM function. Um, on the usage of the central supplier database, um, the view is that the supplier central database does not support tactical to strategic procurement needs. And these are the reasons uh, that have been provided. 
uh, the know your supplier fundamental proce uh, process is not practiced um, in the supplier, um, the central supplier database. Proper due diligence is not done um, in that supplier uh, uh, database. Supply visits, supply visits are not done. Uh, and supplier 360s are not done and supplier the capability matrix is currently not done. So um, the, the, the view is that if the SOCs are in charge and able to have their own databases, um, all these principles will be applied in terms of the supplies that are on there. Um, using preferred vendors helps um, to decrease the time spent in the procurement process um, and other practices that cannot be embedded in the central supplier data database, such as uh, supply chain management, supplier relationship management, inventory management, and segmentation of supplies, etc., cetera, um, are not currently uh, part of um, the capabilities of the CSD. And, and that's posing a problem for the SOCs as they have to do the work twice, um, so to speak. Oh, apologies, I, uh, I skipped that. Under the generic challenges, um, the issue of the competitive bid process um, has been brought up as a hindrance um, to effectiveness uh, of SOCs in terms of procurement. Um, the standard bidding documents are compulsory as per the legislation and regulations. And if they're not completed, it disqualifies the response. And this has led to delays uh, in procurement processes, as there isn't a provision to allow for bidders to amend documentation, documentation and resubmit. So um, should a, big, a bidder not have completed everything, um, they are automatically disqualified, even though they may have been the best bid um, at the time. And also um, the issue of the committee system for competitive bids. Um, the requirement currently is that there needs to be uh, bid specification committees, um, bid evaluation committee, uh, bid adjudication committee, and a standing appeals committee. And um, SCM officials are required um, to be in, uh, members of each of these committees. Um, these formalities at each step contribute to the delay in procurement processes, um, taking into consideration the complexity of the need uh, more days can easily be added at times, and lack of availability and commitment by uh, committee members is also an issue. Um, I think um, the recommendation on this one is that we, we should be looking at uh, appointing appropriately skilled supply chain professionals um, who are duly mandated and delegated to do bid specifications and evaluations, and that um, we can continue with the adjudication system uh, and the Standing Appeals Committee, um, and both of these should include one independent member um, as a recommendation. When we enter into the legislative challenges and the proposed actions, um, the discussion between uh, our SOCs and the National Treasury, uh, we looked at what are the legislative requirements that are a hindrance um, defined the challenges and put forward a proposal of how to manage the, the challenges. So um, number one um, is that the National uh, Treasury um, is required to approve all contract variations um, and or amendments uh, above a prescribed threshold in terms of paragraph nine of instruction three of 2016 and 2017. The, the challenge is that this has contributed to a marked increase in um, state-owned entity irregular expenditures as some contracts would have expired um, as a result of additional um, timelines required for the treasury to have an overview and apply its mind on these um, and their internal processes and uh, SOC internal processes uh, along with the Treasury's final uh, approval. This has had an impact on the SOC's operations. Um, ultimately, the accounting authorities are accountable for such transactions, whether or not the National Treasury supports the, the transactions or amendments or variations or not. 
the proposals that we that have been put forward is that um, the responsibility should reside with the respective uh, accounting authorities of the state-owned companies, um, with have with them um, having the discretion to delegate um, um, to the CEO as a start to manage the risk. And the recommendation is that there should be a quarterly reporting obligation by state-owned un own, own companies to the to the treasury on uh, thresholds above 100 million. Um, the second legislative requirement that's an issue and a challenge for the state-owned entity, entities um, is the requirement for the national treasury to approve all deviations uh, from a competitive bidding process in terms of paragraph eight of instruction three of 2016-17. Um, and the challenge is that the National Treasury has to approve all deviations uh, from a competitive bidding pro process and that the use of OEMs to install and maintain equipment also has to be approved by the National Treasury. Um, it's prohibiting the use by the SOCs of their wholly owned subsidiaries that are under them. And it also prohibits the direct use of organs of state. The proposals um, are put forward as, are that the responsibility should reside with the respective accounting authority, with them having the discretion to delegate authority at appropriate levels within the organization to manage any risk, and that the list of deviations must be submitted to the Treasury concurrently, and that the National Treasury be given 14 days to object to that particular list, and that um, quarterly reporting um, should be done by the SOC um, to both the executive authority and the national treasury. Uh, on number three, um, the requirement for the national treasury to approve supply restriction process in terms of paragraph 7.4 of instruction note three of 2016-17. Currently, um, only the National Treasury can restrict suppliers as it stands. Um, the ability of the state owned um, companies to restrict suppliers who have compromised the procure procurement system um, is, is, is compromised. Um, you need National Treasury approval to do that restriction, and sometimes that takes a very long time to do so. The proposal is that the SOC should be able to restrict suppliers going through. Um, the state-owned entity uh, supply review, and that the list of restricted suppliers uh, will be submitted to the National Treasury, and that the Treasury will be given 14 days to object to the list of uh, restricted suppliers. Number four, um, the legislative requirement is that the preferential procurement regulations only allow negotiations to achieve a market related price. And that's triple PFA implementation guide section 19.10. The preferential procurement regulations do not allow for um, competitive post tender negotiation, uh, which results in organs of states paying a premium for goods and services. Historical prices that are inflicted have a huge impact on cost and state-owned company, companies uh, are undertaking currently major cost-saving initiatives, and this lever will support that. So um, our state-owned entity would like to be uh, able to um, uh, negotiate competitively in a fair and transparent manner with the suppliers, and it should be allowed even where market-related related price has been achieved so that their state-owned entities can achieve the most optimal price and value for money. And then um, the proposal is that the state-owned entities can report on the negotiation savings, um, demonstrating a fair process. Number five, the, the legislative requirement here is the prefer preferential procurement regulations require the National Treasury to approve the second cancellation of tenders, which is uh, implementation guide, section 20.1.5 of the triple PFA. 
The delay in the processes um, impacts on the state-owned companies' operations unnecessarily. It also impacts on the accounting authorities' accountability for such processes as dictated to by the PFMA. Um, the National Treasury may decide not to approve the cancellation, which also causes a further delay um, in terms of reissue. The proposal here is that these responsibilities should reside with the respective state-owned companies, accounting authorities, um, with them having the discretion to delegate authority to the CEO um, to manage this particular risk, and that a reporting mechanism be put in place um, to the National Treasury on second cancellations. Legislative challenge number six uh, is on the preferential procurement regulations on bid evaluation criteria, um, as, as well as the implementation guide, section seven of the implementation guide of the triple PFA. Uh, bid evaluation criteria and principles um, must be developed and agreed upon. And, and so the challenge is that the current evaluation process does not take technical competence into account in the final selection. Our suppliers who passed the minimum functionality level are scored against a 90-10 scoring principle. The consequential losses from poor performance can in many instances um, outweigh the contract value. The proposals that have been put forward is that the state-owned entities must be able to develop evaluation of criteria and must include independent third parties that are not conflicted in um, um, the specification and evaluation committees that, that will be run in the SCM function, um, and that um, SOCs should be allowed to have a concession, a concession to apply an evaluation matrix that takes functionality into account um, in the final award of the contracts, for example, 40% price, 40% functionality, and 20% um, triple BEE. That's the current uh, proposals that, that's being put forward. Uh, legislative challenge number seven um, is on instruction note two of 2019-2020 on irregular expenditure framework on condonations. As it stands, all condonations must currently be taken to the National Treasury irrespective of materiality or value. Uh, the National Treasury makes decision on the suitability of consequence management applied, um, and the, the irregular expenditure cannot be removed from the books until the, the National Treasury condones. Uh, we understand the legacy of historical irregular expenditure as a result of um, state capture continues to hamper the achievement of an unqualified audit opinion on the annual financial statements of of the state-owned entities. The proposal here that's been put forward is that there should be appropriate thresholds for condemnation approval within the delegation of the accounting authority, and that irregular expenditure should be a reportable um, in the annual report of the state-owned companies, uh, and not a requirement for reporting in the annual financial statements, as this has had an impact on the balance sheet of the SOC and the ability of the SOC to source financing. It's been detrimental to the SOC, the fact that the irregular expenditure is included in the FS. So the request here is that um, the National uh, Treasury, uh, along with um, all the accounting uh, regulators, uh, just look at how the irregular expenditure is then reported on rather than putting it in the AFS. Um, the requirement of an e-auction platform. So currently we have a competitive supplier development um, CSD uh, platform. And the challenge is, is that that platform doesn't allow for bidding processes um, to be taken through auction um, and that disposals are not covered in that. And the request is that the SOCs should be allowed to develop systems that will allow reverse auction in line with section 217 of the constitution um, to, to be procured by the SOCs. On the issue of the geographical set aside and local contracts, um, 
the, currently the SOCs are unable to set aside work for local to site uh, in terms of procurement. And the challenges have been that the communities um, have an expectation that the SOCs in the areas that they operate in, um, they should provide them with local to site opportunities for procurement. And this has led to industrial action and, and in some instances, uh, property damage. Um, the request here is that um, SOC should be able to identify commodities um, and services that, qui uh, that qualify for local to site considerations. Um, the example I'd like to give, if I may, Chair for everyone to understand. So South Coal operates in its plantations in some of the most rural areas in Bumalanga and Limbopo. Um, and where they would have a farm across the street or even two kilometers down the road from them that is able to provide them with milk, they are unable to do so uh, because of the, the procurement requirements and they have to go via the, the competitive, the CSD um, to procure milk, for instance, and the milk will come from Joburg, thereby leading to that particular supply in the area not being able to participate in the SOC procurement. Um, a challenge number 10, the directive on advertising, publishing and closing of bids during the, the festive period. Um, this, this is a challenge that's been brought up uh, uh, about by um, our state owned entities. The, dire the directive makes it uh, procedurally unfair um, to advertise, publish, uh, and close bids um, between approximately from the 16th of December to approximately the 7th of January. The National Treasury will issue the dates uh, each year based on, on, on what they would deem to be the time frame they want to allocate. And this happens every single year. And the SOCs have indicated that this makes the operations during that period and challenging so for instance, if you have breakdowns in generation, uh, the SOC is not able to uh, advertise bids during that period to, to get the, the, um, the equipment that it needs. So that poses a challenge. Um, and if the SOC had to continue with the procurement process at that point in time, uh, it will result in irregular expenditure during that operation. So the, the proposals here is that um, the SOC should be able to do procurement when needed for operations without it being deemed irregular. And the proposal is that a criteria must be defined um, for such instances for that closure period and be submitted to Treasury and these should be exempt from being deemed as um, irregular. Um, on the usage of uh, the CSD, which is in the National Treasury Instruction Note 4A of 2016 and uh, 2017. The concern here is that the information in the CSD is not verified and the SOC must still verify the supply information. Um, and the products or services listing in the CSD, they do not, more often, they don't match the requirements for the technical nature of the business and verification must be done per transaction when the CSD is used versus efficiencies during the qualification of supplier into an SOC supply list. So the request here is that all SOCs must be allowed to maintain an internal database where prerequisite supplier checks and verifications are done for the stated products that the suppliers can offer. And also that the SOC must be um, allowed to source for critical components from a closed supply list of pre-approved suppliers. Um, and that the database will be maintained by the SOC and suppliers should be able to apply directly for registration at any point. Um, and and that, that that particular supply database maintained by the SOC is subject to national treasury verification at any given point in time. Um, on the issue of emergency procurement, um, instruction or two of 2016-17, um, currently the challenge is that the definition of emergency procurement does not cover real situation, um, situations of operational contingencies 
such as the breakdown of power units or locomotives, um, resulting in production losses, uh, security of supply or loss of income. The proposal is that the, the definition of emergency procurement must be agreed upon amongst the SOCs and the National Treasury, and that the accounting authority of the state-owned company should have the authority to do emergency procurement based on the wider definition of the emergency to include threats to security of supply. So in conclusion, Chairperson, um, the state-owned companies are willing to work with the National Treasury to reach uh, workable solutions to the challenges. Um, um, as indicated, we have started um, doing the work. Uh, the DG is leading a process with the DG of the National Treasury and the SOCs to talk to these challenges, as have indicated. Um, the, the issues that some of the current provisions are prohibitive to conducting business in an efficient manner and responding to crisis, and that's what we're trying to work through as the two departments. Um, the recent court ruling uh, by the Constitutional Court to the Minister of Finance will require a review of certain legislative prescripts, um, and the National Treasury has indicated that it was working on draft amendments um, to the triple PFA, um, and they were said to be issued uh, for comment in terms of the latest correspondence we have from the Treasury. These were said to be issued for comment for, on the week of the 7th of March. Um, it hasn't happened as yet, so we are waiting for the Treasury to issue um, the amendments and we will com uh, comment as such and the SOCs will comment as such. Um, in the meantime, the state-owned entities have been requested to apply to the National Treasury for exemption to the areas that have been that have that are under contestation as per the court ruling. Um, and the Treasury has given um, um, a Transnet, um, uh, as far as we know, an exemption uh, on, the, on the areas. Um, the, the department will continuously work with the state-owned companies to address um, any challenges impacting on empowerment um, of designated groups through the B, triple BE requirements. Um, and certain exemptions, for example, in respect of uh, the IPPs will need to be reviewed um, to develop local capacity and empowerment of companies owned by designated groups for future IPP contracts and to strengthen the renewable energy sector. Um, Chair, I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, DG. Yeah, no, th thank you very much. Uh, DG, you... And, and thank you for your presentation. Um, the colleagues, uh, 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 Chair, the, the colleagues from the SOE that have joined us, we have uh, the Chief Procurement Officer from Transnet in the meeting as well, um, uh, from... Uh, I'm not sure who is there from from ESCOM, Boyo. Are, are there comments that they would like to make as well in relation to the presentation? Uh, they we worked very closely, a chair with them in putting together the presentation. Is there anything that you would like to add in terms of some of the practical experiences um, and that you are having to to deal with? Um, I think uh, some of the points around. Uh, I think uh, is use of OEMs uh, for uh, for maintenance and support of our quiet system. I think is a is a we uh, are on screen by the way. Um, uh, uh, is a, is an important one. So so we are you, you're the right. As we can make uh, uh, some comments before we hand back to the chairperson. Thank you, the chairperson. Tisan. Yes, Tisang. I just want to request the, particip the, the participant in the meeting or those attending the meeting who have not renamed their gadgets, please to do so, because they are gadgets which are just named as numbers. So we need to know who are the people inside the meeting. So if they can just rename their gadgets. Thank you. Yes, that's very important. That's very important. Otherwise, we cannot 
continue the meeting with people who are not known. You have to to be known who are you in the meeting. Uh, thank you. Um, did you, you were to ask, uh, I think some other members of your team to make their contribution. That's correct. And, and, I, and I'll volunteer. Vule, can you, can you come in first? Yeah, th th thanks very much, Chair, and uh, thanks very much, DG. Yes, uh, the presentation really reflected, you know, the challenges that we have uh, as Transnet. And uh, over and above that, you know, the element of, you know, the usage of OEMs, you know, is very critical from the point of view that, you know, where we are sitting at the moment, uh, we have got, you know, different OEMs that when you go to the market and then you issue out the RFP, you, you know, this time you will get a different OEM that will supply you with the products and the, the equipment that you are looking for. And after five years, when you issue out the RFP, you know, you get a different OEM. And that on its own is really giving us a bigger challenge from the point of view that the maintenance of our equipment within the port infrastructure is quite difficult because you've got multiple OEMs. Uh, that would mean that, you know, in terms of your inventory holding, you will keep, you know, duplicate inventory so that you can be able to ensure that at any specific point in time, whenever there's a breakdown, you can be able to go and, uh, you know, get the space that you're looking for. And that on its own is basically, you know, in increasing our inventory unnecessarily. And uh, if we can be allowed to get to a position where we use a process uh, that is scientifically, you know, uh, addressing the challenges, and we can be able to get one OEM that we can be able to work with across the, you know, across the port system or across our requirements in terms of the technical side, that would help us a lot in ensuring that going forward, we are able to maintain our uh, infrastructure and then the maintenance regime that we have is standard across the rest of the organization. And over and above that chair, one element which is obviously very critical, uh, you know, in line with you know, the issue regarding, um, you know, the, the standardization across the, the, the organization, it would allow us, you know, to make sure that at least when we start to look at the local content, you know, we can start to, you know, support a specific industry because all of our requirements will be really standardized. And then, then we can be able to have an idea in terms of what we are going to need in the next few years. So that on its own is making it very easier for us to make sure that at least our procurement plans are easy, easily managed across the whole you know, port system. And lastly, Chair, I just need to confirm that you know, Vuyo is right that uh, Transnet has requested an exemption on the triple PFA, and we were given the exemption on the, the 11th, which, which was last week, Friday. And we are currently in the process of implementing that, which necessitated that we need to change some of our policies that we have within the organization at the moment, as well as some implementation manual in terms of the process of procurement. However, in terms of the bigger, you know, um, uh, exemption that we've requested, we haven't received anything as yet. And we believe strongly that, you know, working together can help us to get to that solution that will be sustainable and make sure that at least in the long run, we are able to compete with the private sector that we are we are supposed to compete with at the moment. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, thank you very much, Vule. J3 from ESCOM, um, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, I want to confirm that you can hear me, I'm audible. So uh, supporting the, the previous presentation and then of course the sentiments shared by uh, by Transnet, we're exactly in the same position just to reiterate, um, we are trying to reduce the non-value adding suppliers. We're trying to reduce the overall cost of procurement. We are opening and reopening, you know, existing contracts to get better than market related prices, you know, taking into consideration our purchasing power, et cetera. We are, um, you know, we have uh, quite a bit of work we have to do, for example, our transmission and other infrastructure projects. And we really want to actually have relationships with, with suppliers in the long term to build our industry and actually be able to, um, you know, develop the economy. And some of those things 
you know, legislative impediments in terms of how we have to use CSD or other things versus uh, segmenting and actually having um, strategies ac across commodities. I share my sentiment on inventory level with, with my colleague from Transnet in terms of standardization and, and um, use of spares and, and commodities across our fleet. Uh, we have the same uh, issue if, if new supplies come in and in fact on the old fleet that you have to keep uh, inventory for, for multiple units of similar items, et cetera. So there are specific areas we need support. I think the expectations of local communities that their definition of local versus the local definition being South African is a challenge in terms of set asides geographically to help uh, you know, the communities in which you operate. And, and of course, um, some of the challenges as highlighted in the instruction notes, et cetera. We also want to state at this time, we are working closely uh, with National Treasury and DPE. We are engaging with them on a regular basis to deal with applications. But I think you know the volume and the number of items that have to be ongoing is also a considerable strain on, on National Treasury and their resources. And of course, um, I think post state capture, we've put in several controls on the procurement and, and, and uh, contract management side which actually shows that you know, the accounting authority, board, exco, et cetera, are looking at expansions, deviations, and out of the transactions. And, and, it, and we feel strongly that we can actually manage those and, and actually provide monitoring information um, to National Treasury and other authorities and be able to give it the flexibility and agility in our operations to also demonstrate to lending organizations that you know, we can actually uh, conclude contracts and, and conclude procurement in a, in a shorter space of time and actually complete the projects timelessly so that we can be given, you know, the additional funding and requirements that we have that becomes available for our country. So I think we as well have applied for exemption. We've done so slightly after uh, Transnet and we're working with National Treasury to get exemptions from provisions of the um, triple PFA. And of course, in terms of some of those regulations and instruction notes that will be repealed, I think we're also looking forward to the feedback from National Treasury on those notes, such as the PFMA notes that would come out. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very, very much, Jay. Uh, Chair, uh, I must just um, em emphasize here that um, we have uh, been working, working very well with, uh, with National Treasury in terms of raising uh, some of the challenges that um, some of these um, uh, regulations and instruction notes are having on our entities, uh, the businesses, including their competitiveness, because they are operating obviously in a space where they have to uh, compete with other players, especially in the in the private sector, where you know uh, procurement, for instance, has been simplified. There is quite a lot of needs of automation, so decisions are made very quickly. Um, and with the process that we have had, especially some of the deviation that I have to go through national treasure, we are, you know, it takes a long time, unfortunately, to procure. And that can have quite a detrimental in, impact on the competitiveness of our entities. And that has been really well received. And uh, we are seeing some um, uh, a good uh, uh, results from that. And I think the exemption that the colleagues have referred to earlier that came through on Friday is a good example of that. We have been speaking uh, on the and in on the guidelines on the regular expenditure to say that um, it should be this be reporting the annual report that not, not be included in the AFS because it's um, creating havoc, especially with historical regular expenditure that we have with some of the contracts that, for instance, were subject of the Zondo Commission. That um, those stay on the books of the of these SOEs, and in, in some instance, we find a number of contracts that they're having to go through in order to determine uh, the extent of uh, regular expenditure it requires uh, you know, unbelievable amount of, of money versus the benefit that we're going to derive. So as, as a result, we, you know, we, uh, we have said, can we not uh, come up with a better way of, of dealing with these particular matters while ensuring that those that have been found wanting are, are dealt with um, uh, through both uh, internal uh, processes as also through obviously uh, in, uh, involvement of the criminal justice uh, uh, system. So but in, uh, I, I think overall I can say that um, uh, good progress has been made and, and Chair, uh, the intention as well, if I can just reiterate it with this presentation, was also in anticipation of the engagement that the, the PC will also be having with the DTIC 
and um, uh, and a national treasure on the subject, so that at least the uh, you know our experience as DPE and our SOCs, you know, um, you, you you have had um, an opportunity of getting that, uh, so that it can enhance uh, those engagements uh, uh, eventually when they come around. On that note, I thank you very much, Co-Chair, for giving us the space to make this presentation. Um, uh, we'll uh, be guided from uh, by you from here on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dichi. Uh, we still have this gadget, 0170117. Uh, I will now request Mr. Mishumi to take them out. And the 0001020 iPhone also. And I think also the MSOL one. It's not clear who is that person. Therefore, people must uh, try to write their, uh, I mean, identify their gadgets so that they can be understood as to who are they. Um, okay. Honorable members, that is the presentation uh, presented to us by the Department of Public Enterprise. Uh, I will. Uh, start with the Honorable Chabalala Kachalia. Uh, Sisma Wadwe is not there, followed by Komani. Can we go that way? Chabalala? Thank you so much, Chaperson. Um, <clears throat> my network is really, really bad. Um, uh, at this Point, Chair, I think that I'm comfortable with the presentation and, and what is there uh, in so far as plans uh, that has been planned uh, from where I am, Chair. And we want to really commend the work. Uh, the first question will be really the Department of Competitive Supply, this program on Competitive Supplier Development Program. I, I want to say that the department states uh, that some SOCs mentioned that meeting with the minimum threshold for local content in some of the designated products proved difficult for them due to local manufacturers, which are, are unable to meet the specification required by SOCs. So contrary to popular belief at this point, Department of Defense DOT, uh, the South African Police Services, SAPS, and the Correctional Services procure security items which are imported that denial locally manufacturers um, how uh, manufacturers now the question is how is the department using competitive supplier development program to capacitate local manufacturers to ensure the reindustrialization re of the South African economy. Uh, the second one on the designation for local procurement, considering that Dinell and the South African defense industry dire situation at this point, has the department engaged the Department of Trade and Industry and National Treasury regarding the designation of the defense industry for local procurement. And, and while I'm on the defense also, we understand the situation that Dinell is under, it's, it's facing right now. I'm worried about the IP, uh, the intellectual property, and I want somebody to really respond. Uh, what are we going to do with this situation? Uh, because we're talking about these issues of local procurement, and we've noted that SAPS in some reports is that SAPS, when it comes to ammunition, they procure somewhere else and they don't procure denial. So I want to find out from this themselves that what is the plan thereof. Number three, Chair, on meeting local content specifications for certain products. There are products that are in high foreign and domestic demand that offer high returns on investment that some SOCs like Denel have the capability to produce, but there is a lack of working capital to carry them out, which uh, speaks to the point that I've made earlier. So what is the department doing to ensure that national treasury, as well as other government owned development finance institutions provide SOCs like Denel with the necessary working capital to carry out their strategic objective? 
Uh, lastly, Chair, on the competitive uh, bidding processes, in most uh, instances, competitive bidding processes have denied some of the SOCs a base income necessarily for both operational and financial purposes. Moreover, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed how the procurement processes work because countries are encouraged to support their nascent industries that were affected by the lockdown restrictions. Now, what is the department alternative in terms of ensuring that competitive bidding processes do not work to the disadvantage of the SOCs? Should the National Treasury decide not to provide a removal or amend the competitive bidding processes? The last one, Chair, it's not part of the presentation, is this issue of ESCOM. I don't think we can leave ESCOM uh, to what it is right now without really speaking about the issues that are happening in ESCOM. Obviously, one is not happy with the management at this point, uh, primarily because of this low shading that we're experiencing and business is losing really uh, f uh, fundamentally and the jobs and so forth and so on. And we know when you switch off the light, you switch off the energy, what then happens to the economy of South Africa? I want to check around the one, the financing of ESCOM from uh, definitely Treasury, uh, what is the commitment they off? But secondary to that, the management of ESCOM must take us really seriously and the country seriously. I just wanted to express on behalf, maybe in the committee, to say the situation, we, can be, we cannot leave it unattended. We really need to get uh, the CEO and the CFO of ESCOM to really come out and tell us what is the right story, not this thing of switching off and switching on. And, and, and the fact that we're unable to meet the demand and we can see the country right now, when there is a crisis, business nourishes and flourishes. And right now we're seeing the crisis that we're seeing, uh, the conflict that is happening. And, and, and we want to understand uh, what will be the regulations or the law that will be able to assist when there are crises out there, what is the law that is going to assist us to ensure that there is delivery, be it when there is a demand on the table. I'll make a case in example on the issue of coal. Right now there is a demand, but we're unable to meet the demand and that we know that can assist our economy. So what is the sister department, be it National Treasury, doing to assist when it comes to this one? On ESCOM 1, I'll leave that to the DG of Public Enterprise really for his comment. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Shavalala. Honorable Kashalia. Thank you, uh, Chair. With regard to uh, the local supply of key components for ESCOM and Transnet, it is clear that some accommodation is required in this regard. But it needs, I want to stress that it needs to be managed very carefully. And there needs to be clarity on this and on areas adjacent to this. There are additionally some other aspects that require attention that arise from the presentation and that refer to what I've just said. The first one uh, is annual financial statements. Uh, I, I say again, given that the SOEs are required to prepare and submit annual financial statements within five months of the end of the financial year by legislation, what is being done to affect this without excuses. Secondly, in terms of uh, the presentation and the reference to leveling of playing fields by tipping the scales as referred to, uh, the PPPFA seeks to level the playing fields by tipping the scales in flavor of previously disadvantaged and SME, uh, previously disadvantaged individuals and SMEs as stated. This tipping of the scales and procurement issues are intertwined and at the heart of the many problems that are faced at our SOEs. The ring fencing of historical issues apart, it's, it seems as if we have fashioned a rod to beat ourselves. This committee should be seized with this in view of, uh, 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 of the uh, 
of what's going on. And it and as as the as I said in one of the slides, it is it's one of the main challenges to seek an appropriate balance between compliance and efficiency. Now the question is, who will govern and monitor the proposed discretion to delegate deviations from the compliance for, for uh, deviations and compliance from bidding processes and why and under what circumstances? Uh, this is absolutely crucial. The same applies to the proposal from SOEs to restrict suppliers. Uh, proper oversight is required here. And we have been in very muddy waters before, and we need clear policy on this, on this issue. With respect to the matrix proposed on slide 13, the Constitutional Court, as we all know, has abolished the Minister of Finance's promulgation of key regulations of the preferential procurement policy framework. Given this, uh, how are the current proposals, REBBBEE -E, in the matrix, deemed to be compliant? Can it be explained what the effects and remedies to deal with this are? And how exactly, and I mean exactly, not generally, is DPE and finance stroke treasury dealing with this? What is the validity of any deviations proposed from uh, the constitutional court's determination on this? While it is needed to smooth processing, uh, to, for, uh, to, 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 to smooth processing, to balance uh, compliance and efficiency, this should not be used to run counter to the Constitutional Court's uh, determination. Can we receive an unambiguous assurance here? That's my question. Thirdly, uh, there's the question of re uh, ring financing and, and condemnation. Ring financing and condemnation, uh, uh, you know, uh, ring, ring, is required to minimize, I understand, the impact on audit outcomes and debt and debt covenants, uh, covenants. But the shareholder, we must remember, was constant and is responsible historically and now. How is this going to be managed? So please answer in respect of a, annual financial statements, the level playing field and tipping of the scales issue, the ring fencing and condemnation, and uh, the managing of the exemption and clear application of policies uh, and revision uh, 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 and revision of these, uh, rather than opening the door to the minefield of exemptions. I'd hope that the minefield of, of regulations, exemptions, uh, delegation, and control is clear to all. Because remember, that is what got us here. Can we really? use the same levers to get us out of here, I think we must apply our minds to legislation and policy. Thank you. Chair, sorry, Judith here. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I don't know if you can just allow me just one, one second. I won't take long. I did raise my hand. There's two points I just forgot to raise, please. Okay, come. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Chair, there's two points I wanted to ask about uh, the BE, because we're talking about the law right now. And, and I want to understand from National Treasury, with this that we're doing, where do we locate the issue of BE and, of course, beneficiation and ensure that there are other people that are able to participate uh, so that we don't do a law and we get rid of the existing ones and we, we, we kind of pretend they don't exist. So I want to ask that. Secondly, um, let me ask this question about whether do we have an appetite uh, from where we are with National Treasury to look at this thing of unspent budgets. 
we, we, we locate money chair and we've always been seeing unspent budget that needed to go back when is the financial year end. What is it that we're going to do to ensure this accountability and the part of the departments in so far as the, this issue of unspent budget? I think it's either we really need to put not necessarily legislation, but there must be something that speaks to that, uh, whether in the departments, because we can't give money and people don't spend the money and it goes back then there, there must be a reallocation of those finances. I think it's something that we need to look at. Thank you so much for indulging us, Chairperson. I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Honorable Shabalala. Honorable uh, Komani. Chair, uh, I'm very sorry, my, my network is not well. I will send my through a uh, writing. Okay. It's fine, Honorable Komani. Honorable but uh, Kumede. Honorable Kumede. Chair, hope I'm audible. Chair, uh, you are loud thank, and clear, sir. Thank you very much for the presentation, Chair. Uh, I, I think the presentation it gives us, it indicates that it has been well researched and is well articulated and it looks as if the department is clear of, of, of what in fact it's, it's, look, it's looking for. Chair, you know, I, I have a view that uh, if one had an opportunity it was going to be appropriate that the, the, the national treasury is represented in this debate. The, 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 the type of questions that are being uh, posed, in fact, uh, the contender here, which is the, D, which is the DPE, may not articulately and correctly uh, respond to them because it, it requires uh, a nod from the side of uh, the national treasure. So I, I, I've seen uh, the presenter, Vuyo, is confining too much uh, the department or the report to the reporting structure now and again we are to report however that's what uh, kachalia as well as uh, honorable shabalala is raising uh, that in certain instances because i was going to say let's look at the legislative processes where such reporting is put as part of the annual reporting rather than have the reporting that will be done quarterly, because it now makes reporting versus implementation a very critical issue. Do you just go ahead and implement, not having satisfied uh, the national treasury and still awaiting the response whether national treasury is happy or not happy and then you respond? But if it is factored as part of the annual reporting, as part of the annual report, that's fine. I think it, it does make sense in, in, in that process. However, the fear is at times there are SOEs that are not even producing the annual reports. What then do we do in such uh, instances where there will be no, 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 no reports. Chair, I, I'm hoping in these discussions, uh, there is nothing hostile in the discussions between the department in the DPE, as well as uh, national, national treasury. You know, because I'm just thinking there will be quite a lot of movement in terms of uh, defined responsibilities. 
uh, some of the responsibilities that in fact have been uh, done by a national treasury may in fact go down and be augmented to uh, the department and the department is, re re is to recommission some of the people that in fact will do the work of this nature. Chair, you, you know, mine is, uh, let's encourage, because it's quite clear, let's encourage and mandate the department to proceed with uh, the negotiations with the, the, the National Treasury, with the hope that National Treasury will in fact uh, understand the sentiments where the department is coming from, because my understanding or what it should have been is that uh, no one should be crippled when it comes to competitive bidding. And um, I, I wanted to believe that there is a way of a consolidated approach or initiative in terms of unifying all these uh, procurement processes and procedures. Because once there is a gap, the, it's no longer a competitive bidding. Others may be disadvantaged uh, in the process. So my chair, let me just stop there, but thanks very much for the report. I, I, I would love to see when the report is complete, and the National Treasury has given a, a, a response and the SOEs are to implement what the agreement is between SOEs as well as the, the, the National Treasury. Otherwise, Chair, thank you very much. It's a nice initiative. I give it a thumbs up and uh, it's well documented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is Honorable Butelezi on this platform? Apparently not. Uh, Honorable Kwangwa, apologize. Honorable Isaac. Honorable Isaac also is not there. Let's go to Izizi. Zizi. Thanks, Chair. Morning, colleagues. Uh, I think one welcomes the report. Uh, it gives a clear picture of the challenges that uh, we have discussed before. Uh, but for me, this is a start uh, because there seems to be some contradiction or inconsistency in terms of the laws uh, that we pass. Uh, are they enabling enough or they become a hindrance at some point? Uh, look at BEE. Uh, the whole purpose for BEE was to address issues of redress to achieve some level of equality in terms of opportunities uh, given to, to previously disadvantaged individuals. Uh, then you have your PFMA, which is also not assisting the process going forward. But maybe let's start with SOEs, see how National Treasury responds, and then take it from there. But there's still more work to be done. And this is the step in the right direction, which I think we must all commend and, and support moving forward. Thanks, Chair. Sorry, I'm speaking without a meet. Uh, Honorable Kwanazi, are you in a position to speak? Welcome back. Kwanazi? I think she is still recovering. Um, 
thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good yes. morning, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, uh, uh, the Department uh, led by the DG. Uh, Chair, uh, Honor, my colleague, Honorable Members, has covered me on the report as we welcome the report. I think for me, it's clear and we talk to the issues and um, elements that we're looking for. But uh, I want to take uh, from what uh, Honorable Shabalala uh, 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 um, uh, left. I want to support what is what is uh, proposing on the issue of uh, ESCOM, as much as it's not in the agenda, but I think we are the relevant committee to raise the matter and take the matter up. Uh, for me, Chair, uh, between yourself and the department and the secretary, uh, can we arrange maybe a special meeting where we can have both the ESCOM, the DPE, and the treasurer uh, in the meeting and also talk to the issue of communication, especially to us as members, because uh, out there, there's so many distorting information, there's so many fake information, but at least if as members we are keep uh, apart and keep uh, abreast about the information from time to time and the issue of what is happening and what are the relevant departments doing about the issue. Um, uh, sitting here, the, the whole of the load shedding, I don't know what we are, what we, whether we are going or coming or are we winning uh, what, uh, what the challenges are and what is uh, the department ESCOM and the treasurer or the government itself doing. I, I think we really need to understand the whole scenario so that we are public representatives and we need to give a, a public uh, the hope one to uh, the exact information. Also, the, the, the whole thing that nobody raised in this committee to say, I think we really need to communicate very clear to the public that what is it that uh, they uh, themselves as members of the public and I also a citizen, we can, we can do or we can contribute to save the situation or to improve uh, the situation and all the stakeholders. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, I just wanted to, 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 to put emphasis on that and support what uh, Honorable Shabalala has raised uh, on the issue of ESCOM. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Mkwanazi. Honorable Malinga. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Greetings to yourself, members of the Portfolio Committee, the department, and everybody on the platform, including the staff of Parliament. Chairperson, I think uh, my uh, uh, members have, uh, have covered me, Chair, but in, I want to ask something that is neither here nor there in, your, in the presentation of the department. Given what is happening between Russia and Ukraine, is ESCOM going to be able to keep the lights on in the country? Because they, they, they rely on diesel to burn the turbines. That, that, that's my concern, more or less like what the Honorable Mkwanas is asking, Che. Otherwise, are, 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 we, are we sure that we're not going to find ourselves in, in, in the blackout or in the dark? That's all I want to say, Che. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Malinga. I think the DG, the, 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 the list of uh, members who, to engage your presentation has been exhausted. All I can just emphasize from the chair, uh, just to make everybody in terms of our members to be on the same wavelength. I think the intention of this presentation was for the committee. First, we are praised on the policy impediments and engage the department uh, and its entities uh, so that we will be, all of us, informed with the way forward in terms of our next engagement with relevant policy departments. However, there is one or two questions, I mean, issues that I don't really found on the presentation that I think uh, the DG and his team, including the deputy minister in actual fact, would be able to 
to, to, to help me with um, in relation to the presentation. Which legislation that is prohibit public, 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 private partnership, this PPP, which legislation exactly that prohibits uh, that the, 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 those public private pub partnership? Secondly, why can't Transnet and Brasa collaborate as both state entities or institutions? First, to assist the government with its rail and transport challenges that we are uh, being frustrated as a nation. Secondly, why can't Transnet assist Plaza, for example, to build trains as government entities? That, that, that issue, I think it emerged after we have embarked on an oversight visit uh, to Transnet, where we're exposed to a huge infrastructure that was there. And I think that question still need to, to come up. It's a policy issue. To what extent are we creating a situation where Transnet can be in a position to assist Prasa so that we don't have another uh, Chinese uh, locomotive that are still hanging there unused. I think we need to, to, to get that. The truth of the matter is that all these SOEs, if we can be critical of the situation, are actually not designed to prosper. The, 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 the whole, uh, the manner in which we, we do business with, it's like we set them for failure because of our legislation legislation favors every time the private sector. And after that, when they are frustrated, private, I mean, private sector becomes the first shark on the door, expecting to benefit on the carcass of the same in, um, um, uh, uh, state owned entities. I think something Police wise need to, do, to, to be sharpened in this process. This process must help us to deal with all those uh, constraints that are a serious factor in the improvement of the operations of these entities, including some kind of a strong revisit, not changing it, the, 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 the PFMA. How do we make PFMA assisting us? You know, because in the past, including the, the state capture, used some flaws in the PFMA in order to advance uh, corrupt and the state capture orientated uh, shenanigans. I think those things need to, 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 to be dealt with. Uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, we give it to you uh, and then end your Thank you very much. Chairperson. Somebody is chairpersoning me. Yes, oh, yes, Mr. Secretary. Yes, yes, Chair. Uh, Ms. Koman is unable to speak because of the poor network. But she wrote a question on the chat group there. Uh, saying that, what is the department doing to assist entities to be able to do business? with other government departments. I think it speaks to what you have just raised about government departments making business with private sector, but whereas Denel, they can be buying things from Denel. I think it's the same thing of public-public partnership that you are speaking about. I think that's what she asked. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is not necessarily an attempt, Deputy Minister, to bash private sector, but uh, as it, things are today, it seems as if we are actually feeding these entities to the benefit of the private sector, while the private sector is having more advantage to them. You know, I think we need to design our policies 
to protect these entities because these entities are central in the execution of transformation in this country. Private sector has failed us to do plain small things like black economic empowerment. You know, private sector is still dominated by white people who are not willing to share their wealth with the rest of the South African population. Therefore, we cannot rely to them in terms of improving the quality of life of our people. Thank you, Deputy Minister. No, thank, thank you, thank you, Chair. Maybe I should uh, let the team maybe speak to, there are some of the uh, very technical uh, aspects uh, of um, uh, accountability in the procurement environment, uh, the reporting uh, uh, requirements, uh, uh, these declarations, etc. The team can deal with that. I, I may just say uh, today we 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 really came uh, to deal with the the, the regulatory environment uh, impacting uh, particularly. Uh, state-owned companies as it relates to procurement. Uh, how do we navigate the space between the requirements uh, of the Companies Act, the requirements of uh, uh, the, the, the PFMA and all the other policies? How do those policies uh, impact uh, effectiveness, uh, efficiency of uh, these entities? I, I think uh, some of the questions, perhaps we may have to come back on them in another form. For instance, the issues of um, uh, uh, funding uh, for, for ESCOM in, in the, or funding for any of the entities. We, 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 we just came to date just to deal with the, uh, the issues uh, that impact uh, or impede uh, effectiveness, uh, so to speak. And, and, and I think uh, Honorable Mkwanas' uh, uh, suggestion, if I hear well, could be that a different kind of meeting is arranged in which then the treasury can also be present, uh, uh, wherein the challenges that uh, some of the state-owned companies face can be discussed. Uh, I think uh, we uh, will be open to, to, to that kind of meeting, uh, whether it is us or the Committee on Appropriations, or which is the appropriate vehicle that could enable, facilitate that engagement, uh, I think I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with that. It also applies uh, to how we have to manage or administer procurement between state-owned companies. I think uh, the question to do with the challenges that the NEL face, uh, uh, where there could be items that uh, for instance, police can get from Denel. Um, of course, the uh, procurement environment requires that uh, there are certain uh, conditions, objectives that must be met, the way you go about. Uh, you, 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 you can't, I think uh, we, we, when we pursued the matter, it was like uh, they still need to go out on a competitive uh, process uh, that should uh, uh, then lend them uh, the, the, the good price uh, on, on the matter, wherever they get that price, they may get it uh, from there. So I think all to do, I mean, how we look at the way state-owned companies reinforce each other, uh, et, et cetera, it, it's a matter that uh, I think uh, we could come back to with another day. It will have its own impediments in itself. But the DG and the team can talk to, to I think Honorable Kachalia was talking to a very direct matters that I think need to be uh, spoken to in specific terms. And then the rest, uh, I, would, I would really uh, uh, go along with uh, both, I think Honorable Gormade as well as uh, Honorable Mkwanas in terms of proposing how we could look to further engaging on these other matters. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair, with your permission, the DG and then the team. Well, no, thank you very much, uh, Dian. Um, uh, Chair, uh, uh, and the team will just follow after me. Let, let me just deal with uh, a few issues beforehand that have been raised. Um, the first one is around the, the competitive, 
uh, supply development program, which is a program that was um, uh, designed by ourselves as DPE with uh, DTI support, which was intended to basically improve localization uh, through identifying specific subsystems on the pro on the on the various uh, capital programs that we undertook, be it uh, on the locomotives, um, uh, the power station build program, and so on, to, to, to say, how do we improve local content such that we also, that acts as a hedge, so to speak, to, uh, to maintenance and support costs going forward. Because our experience um, had been that uh, because, you know, we have had a, a currency that has um, depreciated against um, the major currencies uh, over time. Um, the cost of, of supporting this system in the long run increases just on the basis of that, if that support is being um, uh, sought from outside the country. Um, the program has, has had um, uh, some successes, uh, Chair, um, uh, but also, you know, it's, uh, we, uh, we also have identified weaknesses in, in, in the program in a study that we had done, I think, about three years ago, and we wanted to improve on that. But the reality today is, is that um, it, one of those weaknesses was that uh, how does it fit in within the procurement uh, system as a whole? Um, uh, you know, because what it would obviously require, it require you to be able to, to favor someone, for instance, who is... Um, who is um, uh, 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 producing here in this country, um, uh, and uh, uh, and obviously also we would want to leverage that to actually enable new manufacturing and uh, maintenance enterprises to to come up in this country. So how do you include that in the value system without uh, uh, creating uh, problems for yourself? And with regard to there's one of the areas in terms of regular expenditure that we found. Um, ourselves wanting uh, with this program. So what we, we then decided to do is to say, um, let's discontinue the program. Let's uh, rely on other programs, which I, uh, where they may not be uh, uh, perfectly um, uh, designed for what we are seeking to do uh, through our SOEs, but they, the, the, the overall objective is the same. Like for instance, the, um, the, the, industrial, the industrial participation program, which is run uh, uh, and designation that are both run uh, by DTIC. So how do we then rather utilize those as a basis for ensuring that, that localization and industrialization objectives are, are, still, um, are still attained? So, so my question to Mesha Walala would be that we have not um, as, a, as an overall objective, we are not moved away from what CSDP uh, represented uh, uh, for us, um, and uh, and it's uh, and with regard to actually expanding the list of products that are designated, and we made a particular reference to in the security front. There is um, work that is um, uh, ongoing. Um, uh, uh, one of our colleagues is not on the line, Mr. Bangan, is quite involved with that with AMSCO and, um, and the National Defense Industry Council um, to, to see, for instance, with regard to small arms, and obviously the uh, munitions associated with, will also form part of that, uh, to get um, uh, a designation decision uh, made on that. And, and, and they are working very hard on it. And I know that uh, the initial engagements with uh, policy departments that are responsible have been positive. So we're looking forward to that happening. And of course, we need to see uh, how do we expand that list so that we also ensure that we protect some of the strategic um, industrial capabilities that we've built up over the years um, in this country. As you have seen uh, in the case of um, uh, munitions and, um, and uh, security forces uh, from municipalities to national level that we are having those being procured outside the country when we have um, a PMP here um, in Pretoria West that is attuned, um, uh, PMP is part of the NEL, which is attuned to, to producing the same product. On the issue of um, the protection of IP, that's um, a matter that um, we are very much assist with. We know there has been uh, weaknesses in that, in that area. Um, we know that there is um, uh, some uh, uh, 
data files, for instance, at, at, at Dinell that uh, were that, that were uh, uh, downloaded uh, illegally and and, uh, and irregularly. And the, the matter is um, the SIU is is dealing with the matter, and some of the culprits that are involved have been identified and they are, they are being traced. And there is a discussion ongoing currently between ourselves and um, uh, and, and arms group uh, and denial, of course, to ensure that we have uh, an appropriate system in place going forward to ensure that those kind of incidents obviously doesn't go, doesn't happen in, in the future. Um, the, on the issue of uh, leveraging um, uh, DFIs to help with local uh, uh, the production and, uh, and as well as uh, obviously industrialization, that is um, it, there is there is quite a lot of effort in that area, including uh, a funding that that has been allocated to to enable this. And and the colleagues from from the SOEs may just want to also um, uh, speak on it at, uh, in terms of their their own endeavors as part of the supply and enterprise development efforts. How, how that uh, has uh, is going. The, the I think the on the, on the issue of the uh, reaction to the impact of the pandemic on the on the country's uh, production capacity, and how do we um, you know direct uh, the the budget that we have you know to get those activities going again or to increase the term for the and a, is an important one and and, and that's a, I think that uh, your your comments was mainly to, to say. How, how does NT and, and their frameworks, how do they get attuned to enable us to, uh, uh, to achieve that? I think that's uh, when, when we have NT here, yeah, it, it may be helpful to uh, that another question be posed to them. I think that on the issue of local industry, the same principles that, that apply with regard to industrialization and localization that I've referred to would apply in, in this particular case to say, for instance, um, should we not, um, uh, you know some of the major purchases that we do, for instance, on the healthcare side, um, you know to uh, you know to ensure the health of our, our people. How do we move that spend from being a, a foreign spend to being a local spend? And and we know about the efforts that are being undertaken, led, being led by DSI, for instance, on producing uh, local uh, uh, vaccines, for instance, and, and and other forms of treatment. Uh, on, on our side, for instance, Dinella did produce a prototype on, on a, vent, uh, uh, a ventilator. Um, we are not successful in getting that taken up, but I know uh, with the DTIC and the solidity fund, there is uh, other suppliers that that were identified to uh, to push that effort in Sholo. In the future, the country is a lot, is a lot more self sufficient in that in that particular area. All right. Um, uh, Honorable Kachali, I think, the, I think the, the, the points that, that you have made with regard to how do we balance, and I'd like it, it to ask my colleagues at, well, at the SOCs to, to just speak to that as well, a balance between um, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that there is um, quick decision making versus creating opportunities for people that do not mean well. Um, uh, to to cause the kind of damage that you have had in recent times at our SOEs, I think that's 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 an important point. Um, and what really what we are ask what we are asking here in terms of national treasury in terms of um, uh, the uh, other the the group CEO, the accounting authority, be given the powers, for instance, on individual is is how the act was originally written, um, uh, and what had happened through the regulations. National Treasury had taken on those powers because, uh, uh, because there the were uh, uh, you know, instances either within the SOCs or within government, including at local level, where people were misbehaving. Now, in Titan, there has been unintended consequences, uh, for instance. So what we are asking is that let's, let's give the authority where it should be. Um, and obviously, in instances of wrongdoing, let's ensure that appropriate action is visited upon those people so that the, min the minority or small group leads to a general rule being created and really slowing down um, the whole procurement system because it has a direct impact 
on the economy as well. Because if you are not um, spending fast enough, uh, we are not having given those um, resources and opportunity to circulate in the economy and ensure that um, you know it creates jobs. It um, it also uh, leads to to increase the economy. Obviously, ultimately, that we have a better GDP performance uh, every year. So, so I'll ask my colleagues if they can just give their their comments there. But definitely on our side, there's no absolutely no intention to undermine it. The decision of the constitutional court. I think uh, the government has generally, uh, in all instances uh, where uh, there has been um, uh, decisions of the courts that has found that either any regulations or legislation that is put in place is not, um, you know, uh, is not um, uh, constitutional. We have always acted very fast to rectify that um, and to ensure we put um, the, the right um, remedies in place uh, going forward. So uh, we can assure you on our side that there's absolutely no intention to do that. But obviously, the, uh, um, the, the, the ultimate intentions in terms of ensuring that we bring our, more of our people into these spaces, that remains. Uh, and as we know, uh, we are in a very unequal country. Um, uh, and unfortunately, the inequality that, um, uh, you know, that basically was there during the apartheid has just continued post-1994. So it's important as, as government that we always look for ways to ensure that we rectify that. Um, and, uh, and sometimes one gets worried when, you know, the private sector is overemphasized. And, you know, here, I think the chairperson also put it quite well. Um, because who's going to participate if you decide to uh, to outsource or to private sites activities that used to be taken um, to, to, to be undertaken by the SOEs. It's going to be the private sector. And the, the consequence of that is that the wealth distribution in this country will get worse if we continue to do that. Now, what we know for sure, um, SDPE and, and SOEs, is that um, uh, we have been able to, to open up opportunities that ordinarily are our people, whether as professionals or entrepreneurs, would never have been gotten access to. And the reality of our country is that the private sector is not doing so well in terms of promoting the social cohesion and social transformation um, uh, messages that literally were the, the uh, one of the, you know, the, what was intended to be some of the outcomes of uh, the, you know, the, the uh, the effort at, at the bring about the changes uh, in 19 for the talks that preceded that, that we shall all work together, government and the private sector, to ensure people are given uh, 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 greater opportunities. And you just have to look at, uh, for instance, the representation of uh, historically disadvantaged people, including women, uh, on the boards at the echelons of these entities. Uh, that. Uh, uh, people coming from those sectors of our community are still underrepresented. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and the, the glass ceiling has literally not moved. So we should just be careful as we use that language that we are not actually closing even more opportunities for our people to play a meaningful role in this space. So that's that's what I uh, that, that's really what I'll say to that. But I think. And I tell you, the, the points that you've made, you have, I think we are all completely aligned um, uh, with them. I'm just saying that we should not lose sight as well of the important um, uh, uh, imperatives in, in normalizing our society that we, we have to undertake. And then, I'm not really sure, I think the second set of questions, um, the, uh, the uh, I think we'll probably find, um, uh, 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 you know, it will, will be quite useful in the engagement of the TIC and, and National Treasury, and that we, we agree with, with what we have, we have raised, uh, triple BE beneficiation. We cannot, we cannot uh, lose that because that's, that's how we are going to ensure that um, improve, uh, we ensure more of our of historical disadvantaged communities are participating in this economy, but most importantly, um, that um, uh, that we ensure that they also are 
uh, are owners uh, of um, of those uh, means of production. So, uh, you know that. Uh, so, so yeah. So I'll, I'll really we were very much looking forward to the discussion on that one as to how do we use legislation and regulations to ensure that those objectives are not compromised. The issue of unspent budgets. Uh, uh, I think one of the one of the objectives of what you are uh, uh, that will be achieved by what you are seeking to do is actually to fast track procurement. Because and spend funds unfortunately also a product of when we do the procurement and the, and the number of steps that we go through uh, to get there. And in some instances, you have to go to National Treasury. It takes you a couple of weeks to get uh, at that response back. And obviously there's a whole lot of effort to also get the colleagues on that side to understand uh, um, what, what the decision that is being sought, what, what does it mean? What are the realities on the ground for the SOC? So that takes time and that has a direct impact of when uh, you are, we are able to spend, therefore, the challenge that you have uh, at land. And that argument, uh, uh, thank you for, for the comments um, that you have made. Um, uh, 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 that's, yeah, really, I think the credit goes to Kivuyo and the colleagues at the SOCs for the work that they have done here. That's really, it's, they've been great in terms of supporting uh, the effort of the DGs and, and the group CEOs in uh, ensuring that we address uh, 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 the challenges that, that are outlined in this presentation. Um, and the point that you're making that we made with regard to reporting, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an important one. And, and how, we, how we see things going forward is that once these powers are, are, are taken back to where they were in the beginning is that nothing stops the National Treasury or the Department to go into the SOC. And for instance, say, can we see the deviations that have been undertaken in the last month? Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, see what is on this, anything that catches their eye that we'd like to have better explained, that sort of thing. So, so what it does in actual fact, it, it releases us to, to play much more of a value adding role uh, in these entities in terms of uh, uh, either uh, uh, improving understanding of these regulations, ensuring compliance with the regulations. Um, uh, so yeah, and uh, that's that's how we see how those things um, uh, have been going forward. And of course, the issue of annual reports that you have raised, and uh, and Dr. Kachelia also spoke to that um, to say it, it's important if the system is going to be relied on that we comply with these requirements, that the entities uh, prepare reports on time and, and, they are, um, and they are put before parliament in line with the, with the time frame that was referred to. The challenge of course has been, on what basis do you prepare the AFS if your, uh, your entity is, is insolvent? Because, you know, um, so, and then what happens is that we, we are waiting for the entity to be recapitalized so that we can prepare the statements on a going concern basis. Um, so if we rush that process, it does have unintended consequences as well. Because if you, um, if you literally, uh, because if you're not going to do it on a going concern basis, it means that you are intending to dissolve the organization going forward. And, and I don't think that's what you want to do. And there's absolutely no hostilities uh, between um, the government departments, DPE, NT, and DTIC. And, we, we work very well, uh, uh, Chair. We understand we are part of one government, and as I said, we have, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a team that we've set up of DGs and group CEOs to address this problem, and, and it has been, it has worked quite well. Um, yeah, um, I'll ask that. That did I mean. I'll ask uh, the colleagues also to, to, if they can just. Uh, 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 speak to, to, to also to the points that you have made, but you are correct. We have to sustain this conversation with an intention of fine tuning the regulations and the and the legislation associated such that it enables us to, to meet the objectives that we've set for ourselves. Um, I'm gonna go DM has, um, has spoken to, to your issue. Um, uh, Mama Linga, uh, uh, maybe J3, you may want to, uh, to, to just I answered a question in terms of diesel supplies in view of what's happening um, in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, it, it, Chair, the, the, as far as I know, in, in terms of uh, 
triple P, um, there, there's no legislation that that stops the public and the private sector working together. In actual fact, there's a policy, the private sector participation policy that we work together with National Treasury to put in place to, to really look at how do we leverage the expertise and in some instance capital in the private sector uh, to ensure that we improve the, the, the efficiency as well as the capability or effectiveness of, uh, of, of our entities. And I, and I think that the work that the colleagues are doing at National Treasury, um, and my apology, uh, at, at the Transnet uh, in terms of uh, 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 you know, increasing capacity at the ports is a, is a good example of um, how these sort of uh, partnerships uh, can be leveraged. Of course, we also want to see more public, public uh, 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 partnerships and um, SOC collaboration. Um, where SOCs also look at to their, to their fellow SOCs to source um, uh, products and services. And I think that what has been uh, denied, I think, has, has been cited many times as an example of an entity that could benefit uh, from such uh, uh, collaborations. Um, SAA can definitely um, uh, do with, uh, uh, you know, get with uh, being preferred by uh, government and uh, SOCs in terms of air travel. Um, yeah, now it's a, it's, it's a much more efficient organization that is in place, but we know it's an organization that's smaller than what it should be. Um, so that support will go a long way in terms of ensuring that, especially the challenges that we've seen with Com Air uh, over the weekend and going into this week, uh, that um, you know, uh, uh, SAA is, is, um, is able to, to have this development up because uh, because it is an essential service. We are a big country with uh, large distances, distances between its economic centers. Um, air travel becomes essential uh, for you, for people to be able to do uh, to do work, and we want our people to travel in this country so that there are no enclaves, you know, there are no people that uh, feel they are separate from the rest of the country. So we want people to feel uh, that cohesion, you know, to feel that they are part of, uh, of one unitary state. Um, the point that you've raised with regard to Transnet and Prasa, there's a, there's a, there's a new bill, uh, uh, National Rail Policy. Uh, uh, it's a policy, actually, another bill that, is, uh, uh, that will be uh, coming through, and, and it is intended to, to, to address this particular point as well. And I'm, and I'm sure the colleagues have seen, so the CFO, the group CFO at Transnet is also on here, but uh, she would want to say something on, on that. The TFR, for instance, they are, they are working on on um, uh, separating operations from infrastructure. So immediately that, what that brings up is you have infrastructure also within, um, within, uh, 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 within PRASA. So how do you ensure that, we, we, you know, that should be, the next step should be to look at how we bring the two infrastructure businesses together, um, both are state owned. Um, and of course operations, because the one is freight, the other one is passengers. Um, it can be separate. The one thing I wanted to say, Chair, when you raised the, the issue of um, helping with, with building, with the manufacturing side uh, of, uh, 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 you know, transit helping CRASA in that area, it, is that there's actually a, quite a very good business and which is, does very well, which is very good trends that were set up here in this country. Um, as a result of some of these uh, localization and um, uh, the strategies that have been done. And that's Kibela. Um, uh, uh, it's, in, uh, it's in Niger. Uh, I have visited it. Um, and really I would urge uh, members of the committee uh, next time they are up here to go visit the, the, the I mean, trains are literally uh, the train sets I and mean, the passenger train sets, that, that is the blue ones that have been uh, quite visible to be like, uh, uh, a couple of months back, Minister Mbalula launched one of those. Uh, they, they have been produced from that side. It's a world-class facility. It's run by young people um, uh, from the surrounding communities. Um, the company has taken uh, young people, young uh, 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 artisans from those, those areas. They are now running that factory. If you walk around here, you find young black women and black uh, 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 men who are responsible for various um, 
aspects of producing a train. So that's one area where I would say there's many areas where trust that needs to help Prasa, but if there's one area where Prasa through that collaboration with Alstom that they've done well is in that particular area. And I really urge you uh, to take the time to go see it. Um, if the child stop there and I'll ask Boyo uh, and, and the colleagues to really uh, feel free to traverse some of the space that may have covered, obviously to give it um, a, a much a closer to the action the perspectives from them. Thank you, Chair Vuyo, uh, uh, and, uh, and I think I've noted Nongu if she may come in as well after you. I think Vuyo and J3 are already deployed in that regard. Thank you. Um, thank you, DG3 Chair. Um, uh, the DG has comprehensively responded to, to all the questions. I think for me, What's left to add um, is the areas that um, Honorable Kachalia and um, Honorable Ch Chabalala had uh, raised in terms of the specifics on the presentation. Um, I think what I wanted to add on there is that, um, as indicated, this is still ongoing work. We are still engaging with the Treasury. Um, I'm appreciative and I take all the questions and the comments that have been uh, given. And I think what we will do is to ensure that these are addressed in our communication with the National Treasury so that when we come back and respond, we've addressed all these uh, specific questions because they also help us in doing the work that we, we are doing. Uh, specifically, Honorable Kachala raised some risks that we need to be cognizant of, and we should be taking that into cognizance. So um, once we, we've done um, with, the, with, the, with the discussions and there's an outcome, I think then we will be able to come back to the portfolio committee and give a report back. Um, I think all that's left, DG, you've covered all the questions if I'm looking at what I've put down. Um, I think the responses that are remaining are from our colleagues at um, ESCOM and Transnet. Um, so I, I'll hand over to them through you, Chair, if you don't mind, thank you. Uh, uh, Chair, yeah. uh, if, I was going to, start to propose before maybe we hand over to the rest of the colleagues. I see and the Porsche who has hand up is the group CEO, so that we maybe give her a chance. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I've seen that hand. I've seen that hand, uh, DJ, but uh, I don't think my question you captured well. I was referring to public-public partnership. That's the policy that I was asking if the, which policy is that? Because there was, in the presentation, there was an insinuation that is not like uh, encouraged in the process, the business between, or the partnership between public-owned entities. That's why my question make a reference to the Prasa uh, um, Transnet. By the way, you did uh, make a reference to that part of the question, but you said uh, uh, something like private, that there's no police in relation to private par public partnership of which I think that's not uh, what I was trying to say. Should I give uh, this, the, 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 the Transnet CEO? Yeah, Chair, you can go ahead and do so, I'll, I'll, and then I'll answer after she has uh, made her comments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, CEO. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Chairperson, and thank you very much, uh, DG, for for giving me the opportunity. In fact, let me start with the with the and and you come and sweep after me. I'll leave you with the responsibility to claim the laws to to um, to state the laws. This issue of public public uh, partnerships is actually a really big problem which needs to be resolved because actually, quite right, um, the, it is difficult, if nearly impossible to work um, between uh, two SOCs. Now, Honorable Chair, the MFMA, the Municipal Finance Management Act, actually I think it's clause 16 of that act enables intergovernmental uh, relations where uh, a municipal owned entity, in fact, it allows quite a lot of really innovative things 
which allow, um, if a particular municipality, for example, has a problem, which is the same as another municipality's problem, and the other municipality has solved the problem and found a service provider, the second municipality is able to ride on that contract and that process to appoint the same company, and it's accepted. In the case of state-owned enterprises, it's impossible. I, we have cases in Transnet where we've tried to work with two entities. Um, one, uh, we've actually got permission to work with them for two years only as an implementing agency. And as much as we tried to argue with the National Treasury that it was beneficial to the government as a system at the end of the day that we were working with this entity. So I'll name them. The first one is working with CDC, with Kucha Development Corporation, and those members who are from the Eastern Cape would know that Kucha Development Corporation has historically, in fact, not only Kucha, the other industrial development, uh, the SEZs, um, the corporations that are running SEZs throughout the country, often go through a period where they have financial constraints because they are jointly funded by the DTIC as well as the province in most instances. So what we were asking CDC to do was to provide project management services that we could either ask them to undertake, and frankly, they're cheaper than the private sector, or we could put out into the private sector. And Treasury has a preponderance to frown against that and to prefer that we go into the private sector. And we say, firstly, they're cheaper, uh, number one. Number two, they are the state uh, at the end of the day. So that becomes, and so for, for us, it's an issue that has to be dealt with. I'll end with the, the last example, which we are still in a constant battle with uh, DTI, uh, with the National Treasury on, is around the CSIR. The CSIR is the institution that belongs to the state, which is supposed to look after the um, scientific research capability and frankly has the added responsibility, which I think requires another discussion for another day, of being the institution that disseminates technology especially to the class of citizenry that the DG was talking to, which is black manufacturers who want to get into the space to get IP for them. So we've been trying to work with them uh, because they too, like CDC, often go through periods when they have uh, funding issues. But we wanted them because their specialist skills would help us in ensuring that when we specify locals to buy, uh, in the case of security, that we specify in such a fashion that it enables the South African industry to have a competitive advantage. Every time we try and work with the CSIR, uh, Treasury comes back and says, no, we should put it out into the market and make it competitive. So I think, uh, Honorable Chair, that's an area that definitely needs uh, to get review and frankly has to be dealt with in a fairly upfront and to my mind requires a very clear, simple uh, policy statement, pretty much like the MFMA already has it. So we weren't asking for something that's new that doesn't exist. Chair, I did want to sort of like come back so that um, in everything that we have raised with the DPE as well as National Treasury and with the Portfolio Committee as well, that relates to the strictures and the constraints that we face as an SOE, I do want to clearly state one point that all of us are at Edom about. We want to remain accountable. We want to remain transparent and would want to report to every single body that we must report to. The only exception difference that we're arguing for is that there needs to be due uh, recognition for the fact that as a state-owned enterprise, we're a company which is no different from any other big company in South Africa. The fact that we talk about our own companies in a fashion which is disparaging is its own problem which we need to deal with. But as a company, I need to be able to, Transnet needs to be able to engage with Bitvest, with um, Anglo-American or any company on the same basis and as fast and with the same speed. That is taken away from us. So you then end up finding a unfair statement, frankly, against SOCs that says that we are inefficient, ineffective and the rest of the like without due recognition for the constraints that we have. So I just wanted to remind us all, in the original verbiage on the PFMA, the act as it currently stands, we have said many times, absolutely no problem with the PFMA as an act. The problem are the series of instruction notes and regulations that have since been shoved into it, which have made it not the original. So going back to the original would simplify all of our lives. Secondly, there's a Companies Act. In the Companies Act, there's a whole chapter 
that talks to the governance and oversight of state-owned enterprises. If we were to implement that, there would be such a significant simplification and the market would be able to engage with us on the same, on the same basis. The points that uh, the DG raises around uh, BE, if we were to implement triple BE as is implemented by the private sector, life would be a lot easier because let's also be honest, the triple PFA as it currently stands and the pricing advantage that it purportedly gives to black uh, companies is not true. We can show you the facts. Very few black companies are able to benefit from triple PFA and win business. Because actually, remember, they're new entrants. They don't have the volume. So they're never, ever able to compete on pricing. But if you were able to ensure that in state-owned enterprises, we implemented triple PE like the private sector, I promise you would get much better outcomes out of the participation of um, uh, uh, SOEs in driving transformation in the South African economy without creating new special uh, special projects. Can I just end on this point on local content? Any company which is trying to ensure that it has a short supply chain, uh, it's cost effective, it's rand denominated, would always buy local, always. It's just, it, you don't need somebody to hit you with a sledgehammer to do that. The problem chair becomes in our case, and also that we can give you case studies where we are forced to create uncompetitive companies in South Africa. And then with the progression of time, and unfortunately they are uncompetitive, we drive it in part, right? Because we also don't procure from them, but because from get go, they were not competitive. They were never going to be able to compete and export their production, they die. We have two critical suppliers as we speak who are in ICU that we need to buy from. In one instance, they don't have a valid uh, tax certificate. The law does not allow us to buy from the company without a valid tax certificate, yet it is a provider of a critical import input for our wagons, which we have a shortage of. So I really think that as we think through and write these policy statements, we may be able to use a little bit more of the experience that we've garnered to ensure that whilst we support local uh, manufacturing, we also ensure that we do not create unnecessary instability. Um, thank you very much, Chair, but uh, absolutely behind all of the proposals that are being made uh, by, DP, uh, by DPE. Did you? No, no, thank you, Chair. I'm going to ask the, the other colleagues if they would like to add uh, to the uh, to discussion some of the points that you're on the other one, but also cited you on one of them if you'd want to come in. Um, and I'll ask Bule and J3 to come in after that. Thank you so much. Thank you, DG. I think I have been covered by most of the comments uh, from uh, the GC of Transnet. Uh, in relation to the work we're doing, but maybe I can also add that in specifically in relation to Prasa Matters, there's a very strong uh, team between the Transnet uh, leadership and the Prasa leadership to deal with all the matters that uh, we need to close out because we already have a working uh, relationship. The, the second comment I would like to make, uh, uh, Chairperson, is around the finalization of the financials on time. What we do see is that in, in relation to compliance to the Companies Act, we generally are ready to report on time. We actually have other bodies like your, your stock exchanges that require that we report to them earlier than the five months that is required by the PFMA. We've got uh, certain requirements to report in four months. So what we do believe is that this request we are making uh, uh, to National Treasury as, we have, as it was presented today, will actually assist to separate because what we do find when we do the financials is what tends to delay us is now trying to do as much as we can in cleaning up in relation to the, uh, to the PFMA requirements. And, and as we are still going through this transition, a lot of work then needs to be done by both the auditors and management but the separation uh, in reporting from the uh, annual financial statements into the annual report will allow us to focus on compliance uh, with the Companies Act, but also the international financial reporting standards. And we do believe that it will take us a long way 
into reporting uh, uh, much, much earlier than we have been able to do. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. No, thank you, Gula. Um, you want to come in? You know, th thanks very much, you know, uh, DG. Thanks very much, Chair. You know, I think, you know, Kosia uh, uh, has covered, you know, to a large extent, you know, the issues that are needed to address. But there's only one part that I just need us to address, more specifically related to the question from uh, Honorable Kachalia and Honorable Chabalala, with regards to, you know, what are we doing as uh, state-owned enterprises in terms of localization and reindustrialization? As Transnet, we have got a new strategy that we are embarking on, which is taking into consideration the fact that we need to identify specific industries, you know, more specifically where we can be able to, you know, have an impact taking into consideration our demand. However, the challenge that we have at the moment, whenever you identify a specific industry that would need to support to reindustrialize, you need to make sure that at least you get an investor that is willing to put money into the country and then from that point of view we are continuing working with national treasury so that we can get to a position where you know normally what happened is that the requirement that we have at the moment is that if you identify a service provider and you support them and you give them a contract of five years after five years you cannot go ahead and then confine that you know you know business to the specific service provider you will need to go to the market and of course that has an impact in terms of the investors ability you know to recover the money that they've invested because they don't have any certainty that they can be able to receive business so from where we are sitting as transnet we need to start to look at uh, contracting with uh, you know these uh, people that are going to you know invest in south africa for a period of about you know 10 years and beyond and you know for us to be able to do that we obviously need to make sure that at least we get support from national treasury and over and above that, you know, Chair, I think it's very critical that when we start to look at that kind of uh, relationship, long-term relationship and partnership, we are not necessarily only looking at the requirements from Transnet. We look at the requirements from other state-owned enterprises and over and above that, you know, you know, look at the requirements or the demand from neighboring, you know, states so that we can, be, we can make sure that going forward, we don't get to a position where we create an industry that will put in ICU like what Pusha has indicated. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you, Fule. Um, uh, Jeffrey, can you come in and can you speak to the issue of, uh, of diesel supplies as well as it is? Uh, there's also some, some, some uh, links to that effect in the, in the push. All right, thank you. Thank you, um, Chair. I think uh, just in terms of ESCOM's position, I think Porsche could you could have been spoken on ESCOM's behalf in terms of our understanding of the procurement rules. So maybe if I can just uh, touch on, you know, um, Honorable Kachalia mentioned something about supplier review. I think that's the only one we didn't cover in, in, in the discussion. What ESCOM is saying, you know, sometimes it's very obvious that there was blatant transgressions of you know, ethics and other issues. And if there's not an expedient process to actually restrict suppliers, they can continue in terms of the same public procurement process not to be excluded from future procurement. And many of these processes takes months or years. And in that process, you know, they continue doing business and they get new business in ESCOM. So I think that's what we were saying in terms of being able to restrict in the first instance, companies that have been found um, guilty through our supply review process. And then and a follow-up process can take place with regards to restricting them into the wider SOCs. I think that's the clarity I want to give. I think in terms of the monitoring, and the reporting, you know, we've 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 done quite a bit to put additional controls in our budget adjudication, to put invisible leadership from the exco on board level on expansions and deviations. And of course, these numbers are moving in the right way to demonstrate that the controls we've put in place are working. So, in fact, that's why we're more comfortable in terms of asking, you know, not just from the Companies Act and our ability to just run our mandate but that we are in a position that we are much more healthier in terms of our current transactions to be given that leeway to look at materiality and volumes, et cetera, that are going to national treasury. And I think the main issue on these regulations is it's a one size fit all. So even if you have a condemnation of 10,000 Rand, you've gone through your, your processes, you've built a loss control function, you have everything done, but it still then has to go for a check and balance. The same thing with the second tender cancellation, 
it doesn't make sense if there's not a responsive market. There's nothing that National Treasury can do other than look at why there was no responses in actually approving such a, a such a cancellation. So when we're saying there are instances that it needs to move back to the to the company, other than just the mandate and our ability to execute our operations, there's not much value add that can come in that approval process. So that's probably what I wanted to add to our suppliers. I think for this for the diesel, we can give a response in writing, but we are monitoring the situation with regards to Ukraine and, and Russia and the supply chains. And we haven't actually highlighted upfront that we've got a major risk in our supply chain as well, but we're monitoring the volumes and of course the price is going up. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Richard, we will get to the question that you, that, that you have asked on public public partnerships. I think uh, the group CEO translators has um, have quite a quite a, uh, a lot on that particular one. I think what what we want to uh, uh, be able to do is um, have the single source uh, procurement arrangements between between the entities, um, obviously with the blessing. Uh, of uh, various authorities um, so that we can, in the process, we can help to preserve the capabilities that we have in, in, those, um, uh, in those entities. And I think that the example of uh, CSR that uh, the group CEO referred to, I think is a, is a classic one. Um, I think we, uh, we are really shooting ourselves in the foot with some of the decisions that we've made in that regard. Thank you so much, Chair. We'll stop there. Thank you, DJ, uh, and your team. Before I declare the meeting almost closed, can I check with the members if there is any quick follow-up? Uh, can two or three members, yes, if sure. they like to have they must just indicate, I'll see it on the, on the participant group. Just put your hand one. Is there any second person you want to put his or her hand up there? Okay. Seemingly is Honorable Kashalia only. And that opportunity is closed. Honorable Kashalia? Thank you, Chair. Um, just in response to the uh, response I received about uh, annual financial statements, um, when an entity, I mean, the common practice, in fact, the, the required practice, as I understand it, is when an entity does not prepare financial statements on a going concern basis, it shall disclose that fact together with the basis which it prepared the financial statements and the reason why the entity is not regarded as a going concern. Now that needs to be done. Uh, there's no way around that, even if, if, it's, if, if it's practically bankrupt and insolvent, as many of them are. Uh, on the question of redress, um, uh, yes, absolutely, we have we have a long way to go in terms of, of redress and there are issues that need require redress. Uh, and I agree with the, with the DG. The problem is, however, that the levers uh, that were used in the past and present to ameliorate this chronically unequal society have been faulty to say the least and have in fact empowered elites. And this needs to end. We cannot repeat this. So that's just to clarify my position on that. Uh, thirdly, uh, I look forward to the, thank you, uh, Vuya, I look forward to the, to, to the you know, hearing about your engagement with Treasury. Uh, uh, we need to understand that properly. And fourthly, uh, with regards to uh, Porsche Derby's uh, uh, comments, uh, yes, I hear all that and I agree with a lot of it, but we do need transparency. For example, there are, there are uh, uh, entities and companies and individuals poised to position themselves, for example, in the new dispensation in the ports in, uh, in, in Durban and elsewhere. And uh, we need full transparency here. Uh, and, and, and we need to dig behind the scenes because otherwise we're just going to end up wittingly or unwittingly uh, become a party to the same old madness that we were. Thank you. 
Thank you, Honorable Kashalia. Uh, did you? No, no, Chair. Really, those were the, uh, the, the just the remarks uh, that uh, Honorable Kachalia was giving uh, in respect of the responses he got. If we proceed along that way, it will be just a, an, on, an, an ongoing thing. I think uh, the points he makes are noted. Okay, thank you. I gave them an opportunity to make follow-ups. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that didn't go that way. Um, honorable members, I think we reach uh, the end of the engagement with the presentation. Uh, my now is to thank the deputy minister and his team uh, for the presentation. I must agree with Honorable Kumede. This is a very interesting uh, presentation and the, it's an eye opener and it's gonna be helping us in the sense that it will uh, open our mind to understand broadly as to what we are dealing with here and the water constraints, water opportunities and so on. And the, I think it was a uh, I agree with that have raised that point. Thank you very much, uh, the Minister and the DG for this uh, information. Hope that this process is gonna help us towards resolving all these policy problems that we experience and you will improve the, the proper functioning of this uh, that we have a responsibility to play our oversight role as a legislative arm of the state. Therefore, thank you very much. We are releasing you now, but the members must remain behind because we still have another business to complete. Yeah, while they are leaving, honorable members, I'm seeing a hand now, or is it a legacy hand, honorable Kashalia? It's an old hand, I'll take it down. Okay. Uh, honorable members, uh, let's ask the secretary if there are any minutes that need to be adopted to be presented quickly so that we can be in a position to finish our meeting. Secretary? Yes, Chair. I do have minutes of the previous meeting. Okay. I have just been working with a few things on my computer here, so I'm trying to. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that, Chairperson. It's the minutes of the 2nd of March, 2022, which was the, uh, the department briefing us on their midterm mid mid performance uh, 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 for the department and state-owned enterprises. Um, the minutes basically was led, the department was led by the deputy minister and the DG, um, Mr. Kakodi. Um, the, the, the performance of the, the midterm performance of the of DPE basically dealt with the 
midterm financial report for 2020-21, the human resource management, financial performance issues raised by the Director General of South Africa, and also performance per program. Also the performance report for all state-owned enterprises. And then that's the, some of the salient issues that were raised by the members, uh, um, including some of the key responses that were given. And then the committee also adopted the minutes of the 16th of February, 2022, and the 23rd of February, 2022. Thank you, Chair. Oh, those are the minutes, honorable members. Can I get a member who will help us with the adoption? Chair, Chair if I may just say that in terms of the minutes, uh, uh, it doesn't state which members raised what. And I think for, uh, for, for record keep, accurate record keeping, uh, the, the names of, of, of members of the committee uh, need to be put next to what was raised, because I think that's important for historical purposes. Okay. No, 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 point, I disagree. Point you noted. Do. I think that you are, you are, you are, I think the minutes okay. you are. Chair? Hello, Honorable Malinga. That's not how minutes are captured. In minutes, you capture the proposal and the agreement. It's only when the minutes are adopted that the name of the person will come into the minutes. No, that's not how you write minutes. As long as you, they come in. You write the proposal and the agreement in terms of the proposal. Yes. Let's not fight for this. It, it, it doesn't work. Let's just agree that at least the, 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 the person who actually adopted and seconded the minute will capture that. I don't think we must have a problem with that one. Can somebody add? Adopt the minute so that we get uh, get the the second for I mean the move for the adoption. Chair. Yes. Honorable Damini uh, moves for the adoption of the minutes. Thank you, Honorable Damini, for that. Is there any seconder? Chair, I will second on the basis that they are. Uh, at a later stage, the names are added. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Kashalia. Uh, seconding the minutes. Is there anything else, uh, Mr. Mochumi? No, Chairperson. Okay. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, Honorable Members. Recording stopped.